Thank you. We are live. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to our sixth and last sustainability webinar in 2019. Um, my name is Karin Bursuren. I'll be your host today. Um, I'm a doctoral student here at Teachers College. Um, the pilot series was launched by the Teachers College Initiative for Sustainable Futures and the series uh, called Thinking Global, Educating Local was initiated with the goal to leverage technology to connect researchers, experts and teachers. Um, we're using Zoom today as our technological platform. Welcome, everyone. Um, I've muted all the participants, so you won't hear any background noise. Um, and you have a couple of function, functions at the bottom. You have a chat function. If there's anything you want to communicate to us, use that. And then you also have a Q&A function um, to send us questions. Uh, we have two presentations today, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions um, after each one of them. Um, most of them will tackle at the end of the webinar, but feel free to send us questions um, through the Q&A function throughout the presentations um, so that we can see them. Um, so there's no doubt that climate change is one of the biggest challenges of this century. And we know that scientists around the world agree on the warming of the planet, um, on the fact that human activities cause this warming, and that the fact that storms and other national disasters are amplified um, by this global warming. And in previous webinars, we've talked about the urgency of uh, collective action and of individual action, um, and the roles that schools and education can play in this. And I wanted to begin this uh, webinar by showing you research done by two professors here at Teachers College, um, Oren Pismoni Levy and um, Aaron Pallas. Um, I can. There we go. Um, who did a public opinion study um, in the United States and polled more than 3,000 adults on their views um, on teaching about climate change in schools. And 77% um, said that it's either very important or somewhat important. So consider that it's very, very, that it's, that it's important to teach about climate change in schools. Um, the second slide shows uh, the breakdown um, of the people that said it's very important by demographics. Um, and you can see on this slide actually that there is an ideo ideological divide and that liberals are more likely to say um, it's very important. Um, also women and educated, um, highly educated people tend to say um, it's, it's very important. But I also wanted to point out that there is a difference here in uh, between urban, suburban and rural, and that uh, people in urban areas um, are more likely to say it's very important to teach about climate change and global warming. Um, so this webinar series was actually initiated also to, to support teachers in uh, providing resources on, on how to do that. So how can we teach about climate change um, in classrooms? Um, and one of the ways to do that is through um, citizen science projects. Um, last, um, in our last webinar, we had educators from the uh, Children's Environmental Literacy Fund who also talked about citizen science project and showcased a um, how to do a project uh, around air quality using air beams and have students collect, analyze data and also take actions, um, uh, action with, with local politicians. Um, Today is a whole different focus, actually. I'm here, I'm joined here with people from the Le Mans d'Or, the Earth Observatory, um, and schools, citizens, students have an opportunity to work with them to collect data, um, send them to um, you guys for analysis and sort of um, add to scientific data, um, add to our knowledge about um, climate change um, and microplastics. And we're doing this through snow, and it's very timely because today is, of all days, it is snowing. <laughs> um, so citizen science projects are, um, my definition is local place-based and crowd or student source activities to collect, analyze and report data to advance scientific knowledge and increase public participation in research. Um, and sometimes there also, there's an advocacy component, um, sort of a political agency component to that, um, to, to look for policies that um, fight climate change um, and, and pollution. Um, so today, oops, we have, I'm pleased to introduce two educators from the Le Mans d'Or, the Earth Observatory. On my left here are Laurel Zaima and Patrick Alexander. 
And Laurel is a scientist, a marine biologist, and an environmental educator. She works with Le Mans polar climate researchers to teach about climate change, sea level rise, and changes, changes to Earth's systems with a strong emphasis on the changes occurring in the polar regions. And Patrick is a postdoctoral research scientist studying snow and ice processes at the Le Mans Doherty Earth Observatory. And his research focuses on how the surface of Earth's ice sheets are changing in response to climate change. So Patrick will start of us start of us start us up with a presentation on their X Snow project. And again, there will be an opportunity for questions after each presentation, but feel free to send us a question using the QA button. So okay. welcome, Patrick. Okay. And welcome, Laurel. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna start by talking about the X Snow project. Um, which is a project uh, started by Professor Marco Tedesco at the Il Mont-Darty Earth Observatory. Um, and uh, the main focus of this project is to, well, there are two kind of focuses. One is to get more measurements of snow in the, along the east coast of the US. Um, and the other goal is to get uh, people, especially students, uh, interested in studying snow and to learn more about how climate change is affecting snow and how that affects our lives also, um, and also what we can do about it. Um, so I'm here with Laurel, uh, and Laurel is going to be talking about uh, how you can get involved in this project and also uh, another project called Plastic Snow, uh, which you'll hear more about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so welcome to the X Snow Project. Um, so how do you become a snow scientist? <laughs> uh, so it all starts for some of us at a young age. Um, so on the left here is uh, the leader of our group, Marco. And he, this is in Southern Italy. Uh, so he grew up there and they didn't get much snow. And this is the first time they saw snow. And he was fascinated then. And ever since then, he's been studying snow. Mm -hmm. um, and on the upper right is Laurel. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also Paolo on the lower right, another member of our team and that's me in the middle uh, mm -hmm. New York City um, so snow is fascinating and we've all many of us have experienced that from a young age um, but also it's important for the climate system uh, so snow covers a large area of the earth's surface and it actually helps to regulate the temperature of the earth. So because it's a very bright uh, material, it reflects a lot of sunlight and that uh, keeps the, that cools the surface of the earth. Um, at the same time, uh, snow can insulate the ground. So it can actually serve as a blanket to keep the ground underneath warm. Um, and snow is important for hydrological Region, uh, reasons. Um, and snow is part of the cryosphere, which is basically all of the snow and ice on planet Earth. Um, most of the uh, most of the material in the cryosphere is uh, on the Earth's ice sheets. Um, but actually snow, snow cover on land covers the largest area in terms of percentage area. Um, and so it has a big impact on climate. Uh, most snow cover is in the Northern Hemisphere and snow cover can even affect um, regional weather patterns by changing the atmosphere above it. Uh, snow is part of the water cycle, which is the cycle that takes uh, water from the oceans evaporates from the oceans, goes into the atmosphere, uh, moves over land, and then 
falls as precipitation and runs off the surface or flows through the ground as groundwater flow. And snow is important in that system because it represents a water storage term. So uh, some of the snow that falls from the sky can stay on the ground um, and be stored and then later released. So in some areas where uh, they have seasonal precipitation, snow can be an important source of water during the dry periods. Um, but with climate change, uh, obviously we're going to see some changes in the amount of snow and the timing of when snow melts. Uh, so this uh, figure is showing uh, how uh, streams in the Northeast US are going to change in response to changes in snow melt. So because temperatures are warming, uh, snow is going to melt sooner and it's already uh, melting sooner in the season. And that's causing the stream flow to peak earlier in the season, which can affect uh, living things in the streams. Uh, I mentioned before that snow can uh, insulate the ground. Uh, so it can actually affect the growth of trees such as sugar maples. So this is from a study where uh, they're, they're projecting the change in insulating uh, ability of the snowpack in the future. So the, the lower left here is showing uh, how the snowpack is going to change in the future. And that's going to affect uh, vegetation, uh, particularly trees, uh, because the snow kind of insulates the surface, the ground, and that um, helps the trees to grow over the winter season. Um, snow is also economically important, uh, so um, it can cost uh, winter sports industries a lot of money uh, if uh, the snow disappears. Um, and it's not just um, less snow, there's also a more kind of extreme events which can complicate the ability to plan for a season. Um, and right now, some of you are probably experiencing the negative effects of snow, possibly. <laughs> uh, so we were even affected coming here. We <laughs> made sure to leave early to get here on time because the snow is affecting travel. So, um, and going home today might be also a problem. Um, so this, uh, this is a video uh, that's showing, this is derived from satellite data. So it's showing the snow accumulation over the course of a season. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of snow that falls in the western part of the US, uh, but there's also quite a bit that falls in the east coast. And up until recently, a lot of research has focused on the West Coast, in particular in California, where uh, snow is important for water resources. Um, but some of the graphics I showed before show that snow is also important for the East Coast. So that's sort of what our project is focusing on. Um, so how do we measure snow? Uh, well, there are satellites that orbit the Earth that uh, basically take images of the surface and um, some of them operate on a daily time scale, some weekly. Um, and so this video from NASA is showing uh, how snow covers changes over the course of uh, seasons um, from the satellite measurements. Uh, so this is just seasonal snow cover changes over Eurasia from satellites. And uh, there's some satellites that can tell you whether or not there is snow on the ground, and others can actually tell you the amount of snow that's there. Uh, one thing that we can't measure so well is the density of snow from space. Uh, so it's pretty much just the amount of snow. The snow depth is something that we have to uh, 
take models and combine with the satellite measurements to get better estimates of. Um, so this is a more detailed look at uh, the west coast uh, where snow is very important for the water resources there. Mm. Uh, so that's sort of at the mac uh, macro scale, but we can also study snow on the micro scale. Um, so we can look at individual snowflakes under a microscope, and the uh, shape of the snowflakes can actually tell you something about the atmosphere. Um, so uh, some, some of you might have heard that uh, no two snowflakes are alike. <laughs> um, which I think is basically true, uh, but there were some laboratory experiments where they produced some very similar snowflakes, but mm. they were still a little bit different. Um, but uh, the different shapes and sizes of snow grains falling from the sky is affected by the atmospheric conditions. Uh, so this graph here is showing how temperature and supersaturation in the atmosphere uh, affect the different types of snow grains or snowflakes. Uh, so the supersaturation is basically how much water is held in the air in excess of what it's supposed to be able to hold. Um, so if you have uh, a lot more water vapor than the air uh, should be able to hold, then you get different types of uh, snowflakes forming. And snow can also change once it falls to the ground. So on the upper left, this is uh, what a snowflake that has just fallen from the sky uh, might look like. Uh, so a very uh, beautiful sort of pattern. But over time, it starts to change. Um, so the snowflakes tend to get more rounded. And uh, with liquid water and other different factors, they can change over time. And by looking at the snowflakes in the snowpack, you can tell uh, the conditions that cause these uh, snow grains to change over time also. Uh, so the X snow project uh, is focused on uh, we want you to help us make a lot of measurements of snow. Um, and the reason for that is partly because uh, we want to compare the measurements on the ground with satellite measurements uh, to make sure that the satellite measurements are correct. Um, another reason is that uh, 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 we want to um, look at how snow is varying over local scales, uh, which we can't really tell from the satellites so easily. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the some of our field measurements that we're taking. So in addition to the citizen science work, uh, we're also collecting our measurements in some field sites. And so the map on the left here is showing the areas uh, where New York City gets its water from. And uh, the images on the right are showing the amount of snow uh, from some measurements and model uh, results. And so the darker areas are sort of where there's more snow in the mountains um, in New York State. And uh, so this area is within the New York City watershed so the snow can be important for the watershed. Uh, so we chose a field site in that location to make some of our measurements. And so this is, uh, these are some photos of us on one of our uh, field trips. Uh, so this instrument is in the background is a spectrometer and that's measuring the, how reflective the snow is how much light it reflects, which can affect how much energy is absorbed and how fast the snow melts. Uh, this is a drone, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing with that. Um, 
This is a snow crystal card. So it has a black background with a grid on it. And uh, you can put some snowflakes on the crystal card and take pictures and see how big they are and the shapes. Hmm. Um, so this is something that uh, anybody can really do. Um, and these are some of the uh, tools that we bring to the field. These are uh, brushes to spread the snowflakes on the card. Uh, this is an electronic scale and also a, a manual scale that we can use to weigh the snow to see how dense it is. Uh, and this is a thermometer for measuring the temperature of the snow. Uh, this is a clip-on lens that you can attach to a phone, a smartphone, uh, to take close-up photos. And this is something that we, we also want uh, people to help us with. Um, this is a microscope that we brought to the field to take similar close-up photos of snowflakes. And these are some of the images of snow that you can get from a smartphone. Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is the drone. So what we're doing with the drone is we're taking uh, photographs of the surface and we can take photos from different angles and create a 3D reconstruction of the surface. And we take these images before the snowfall and after snowfall and based on how the 3D surface changes, uh, we can see how much snow fell uh, over time and where the, uh, how the snow depth is distributed spatially. So this is a video uh, showing the drone taking off. Okay, ready when you are. And then this is what it looks like uh, from the drone. This is a video taken from the drone. Uh, so normally it would be sort of going around this area, uh, taking photographs, uh, which would then be stitched together to make a 3D reconstruction of the, the surface. Uh, and then this is also a video taken from the drone that shows some members of our team making measurements. So we can compare these ground measurements with the drone measurements and uh, assess how well, uh, how accurate the drone measurements are. Uh, so these are uh, members of our team. They're, they have a ruler here. They're just sticking it in the ground and measuring the snow depth. And they've got a GPS uh, device to record the location and they're also taking some notes manually and they've also got a smartphone uh, that has uh, a geo it's also geolocated so that we can tell the position of the, the measurements so this is also measurement that's pretty easy to make and uh, we want people to, to make these measurements and so on the left here, this is uh, what you get from the drone. Uh, so this is a 3D reconstruction of the surface. And on the right is um, basically all the stitched together images from the drone. And this is sort of at another angle. Uh, these are all the locations where the drone took photographs. Perfect. So as Patrick said, we have a really strong team of scientists that can collect this um, data, but we need your help because we can't go throughout the entire Northeast um, to collect this information. So if you would like to be involved in the Citizen Science Project, um, you'll be working with us, most likely coordinating with me. I'm an educator at Lamont, and that's kind of how I got brought onto this XNO team. Um, 
So a little bit of background about X snow. Um, of course, the season is in the winter time. Um, every winter, whenever there is a first snowfall to the last mm -hmm. snowfall, we want you guys to get out there and collect these measurements. And this is something very easy that you, you could do with your students of all ages. And I'm gonna go through a couple different measurements that you can take, but keep in mind, whatever you can take would be beneficial. You don't have to do all the measurements, you can do whatever you have time and the ability to do. So the first thing you need to do is pick a spot where you have easy access to that you could go year after year of freshly fallen snow. We don't want anything uh, disturbing this nicely freshly laid bed of snow. We wanna get metadata for um, the data that you're collecting, which means background information. So date and time, location, and as Patrick said, you're gonna take a picture of your site and make sure that the location is enabled on your phone. So that way we can geolocate wherever you are. Um, also, we would like to know the weather conditions, if there's clouds, what the temperature is, any type of precipitation, all that information is important for us as well. And again, if you have the ability to pick a site where you have easy access to maybe something um, by your school, that would be extremely helpful to have this legacy data, this long-term data set at one location, and that's kind of what we're looking for, to see how the snow changes through time um, with the implications of climate change. The first measurement you're going to take is um, the snow depth. So you're going to use, this is a yardstick, you can use a meter stick, a ruler, depending on how deep the snow is. Um, very easy, probably have this in your classroom already. You just stick it in the snow, you wanna write down what the depth is, and then take a photo of it. Again, making sure that the location is enabled so you can geotag these pictures. So that's an easy first measurement that you can take with your students. Um, the next measurement is looking at snow on the micro scale. So Patrick mentioned that we have these snow cards. Um, this is a metal snow card you can purchase on Amazon. Uh, there's a link on our website that we can direct you to. They're about $20. If you don't have uh, the capacity to purchase for this project, you can also go to our website, print out these snow cards and laminate them, which would be an easy alternative. Um, these have a scale on them, one millimeter, two and three millimeters in size. What you're going to do is um, take a brush and kind of brush a couple of flakes onto the card. And then you're going to take a picture of the snowflakes um, with any smartphone with that macro lens that Patrick is also talking about. Now this lens can also be purchased on Amazon link in our website as well. They're about $20 um, and they clip on any smartphone right over your camera and you just need to focus it right onto the snow card and get some beautiful pictures of these snowflakes. Um, so they don't just get size. You then from these pictures can identify what type of snow this is. And we have these uh, easy coatings on the back of the card. So a freshly fallen, pristine snowflake um, might be symbolized as the plus sign, whereas as the conditions change, the snow also changes shape. And so you can use this um, picture as a reference for what your snow is looking like. All this data is uh, then recorded and sent to us online. This is on our website. It's really easy to fill out um, and you would put your institution as your school on there as well. And of course, you're collecting this data, you are helping us gain a better understanding of snow in the Northeast, but it's also important for you and your students to make personal pledges um, as, as we face climate change. And so any, anything you can do in your own life is extremely beneficial. This is a poster that can be printed and put in your classroom. Um, when I use this poster with students, I make sure that they write their name or make a pledge on something they're not already doing because what they're already doing is great, but we're still facing um, climate impacts. So they need to do more than what they're already doing. If you have students that live in the city, they may already be uh, walking, riding their bike or taking public transportation. So maybe you can encourage them to take shorter showers or to skip the dryer and hang dry their clothes instead. Things like that, very easy things like students of all ages can do. And of course, if you have any questions or need additional information, you can go to our website. Um, it has all of our contact information as well if you'd like to email us directly. So that is the first project that you can join. Uh, are there any questions about XNO Citizen Science Project?
So please feel free to send us any questions using the Q&A um, function. Um, I, I have a question. Okay. Um, so, so you said we need data for the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the boundaries and where do you, where do you stop that? Where, um, you know, can, can somebody in, in the Midwest still send, participate and be part of his team and join you or? Yeah, maybe Patrick has a better idea about this hard boundaries. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there's a really hard boundary okay. right now. So you uh, welcome but... any. Yeah. kind of data. Yeah. I think the big okay. thing is that there's a lot of research being done uh, in the West about snow depth and density and not so much happening in the Northeast. And so that was the main driver of the XSNOW project. All right, great. And on, on your website, do you have um, data from previous years um, or other locations so that students can, teachers and students and, and citizens can look at it and already see what is happening to sort of support why we're doing this and why it's important to look at snow to see the effect of climate change? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, uh, we started last year, uh, so we don't have any data up there right now. Okay. But uh, we're planning to, you know, put it up there in a, a nice way so that people yeah. can... Uh, so great opportunity for anyone to... to um, to add the science, to add data to for science to to better understand uh, climate change. Absolutely, the of snow. Yeah. Um, any questions at all? No. Okay. Then we'll we'll move on Launch to the next, next project. Yeah, we'll... Perfect. So um, this is a parallel running citizen science project that will be um, happening um, in winter 2020 2021. So a year from now, um, we're looking at plastic, microplastic particles that can be deposited by snow. So microplastic, I'm sure, is a buzzword that you've heard in um, social media or the media in general, um, but it is a, a widespread problem and we don't have a ton of information about how it can be disseminated by uh, snowflakes atmospherically, so that's what this project is all about. So a little bit of background on microplastics. Um, it is a wide-ranging plastic pollution problem, but it is on a micro scale. So anything that is less than five millimeters, more than one micron, is considered a microplastic. There are two broad categories of microplastics. One is the primary, so that means that these plastic particles are manufactured at this microscopic level, um, oftentimes used for personal care products. So those would be microbeads. They would be used as an exfoliant. Um, microfibers are synthetic plastic uh, fibers from clothing, actually. Um, nurdles is the term for a virgin plastic pellet that is then manufactured to create different plastic products. So those can fall off of ships or in transit to the factories where they're being made into plastic products, they can be lost. And so those enter our environment. And then plastic media blasting is an abrasive form of cleaning surfaces and sanding surfaces where they just take plastic fragments and blast them um, at a wall to smooth it out. So these are primary sources. Um, secondary sources are forms of macro or larger plastics that have been broken up and degraded uh, through a couple of different processes, one being physical fragmentation, so the um, actual breaking of the macro plastics into micro-sized, um, oxidation, bacteria, and photodegradation from the sun, whether it be um, heat or actually the UV rays can break up these large pieces into the micro-size. So examples of those would be fragments, and you can tell because under a microscope they have really jagged edges, um, pieces of film which might be broken off from a plastic bag, foam or styrofoam, common term, uh, pieces of that I'm sure you know how easily that breaks up. Mm -hmm. And then once microplastics are in the environment, um, they have a tendency to cluster together. So that would be um, considered a secondary form as well. Um, and microplastics come from a variety of sources, uh, but according to the International Union 
for conservation of nature. They have found that the largest uh, source of these microplastics in the ocean are from synthetic textiles. So those are your um, synthetic clothes. Those microfibers can be shed from your clothes from the washing machine and dryer. They get put right into the water system and our water filtration doesn't go fine enough to catch these small particles. So that's how they enter our world. Um, car tires, the second largest source, City dust, which can be um, both fragments and fibers that kind of get kicked up into um, highly urban areas. A um, couple of other larger uh, examples as we go down as well, but those are the big three. And although we call all of this plastic, plastic is made out of different types of synthetic or semi-synthetic compounds. So it's not all made out of the same thing, but traditionally they are chemical compounds derived from oil and um, natural gas. So these are a couple of different plastic polymers, but the main ones I wanna focus on, polyester, which it would be a microfiber, those are in your clothes, polyethylene, so those would be um, a lot of your harder types of plastics and plastic bags. Polypropylene, bottle caps, drinking straws, so another form of plastic that can be made into um, harder plastic products. And polystyrene, um, also commonly known as styrofoam, so those are foam peanuts, those foam containers as well. Those are um, the big four pieces that we commonly see. Now, plastic, um, because of the chemical structure that they're made, they never biodegrade. Instead of breaking down, they actually break up into these tiny pieces of microplastic. So here's the problem. It could be, like, it's arguably one of the biggest design flaws in history because we use plastic so commonly throughout the entire world um, for single-use products. But once you use this, for one time and you throw it away, it never breaks down. Um, instead, it breaks up, as we said, and that is why it's just become this huge problem and microplastics have become ubiquitous into the entire world. So if you really think about it, all the plastic that was ever created on Earth still exists today. And just to really understand the scale of this issue, this is the Milky Way galaxy. There are over around 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. But in comparing the Milky Way galaxy to plastic in the ocean, there are 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean, which is 13 times more pieces of plastic than there are stars in the galaxy, which is pretty, it's even hard to grasp the scale of that. Um, and, and these are, soft-ish numbers. It's hard to know how much plastic is out there because they are smaller than the micro scale. They can even be in the nano scale, which is even harder to identify. So these microplastics, because of their small size, low density, and persistence in the environment, have the ability to be transported throughout the world, even through places that are the most pristine, like the Marianas Trench, the Arctic, the Antarctic, the French Pyrenees Mountains. Um, there's been new research coming out about microplastics being spread to these areas. And the way they can be transported are um, through ocean circulation. So once they enter uh, the ocean, they could get pushed around into different regions. Um, they can bioaccumulate through the food web. So if one organism eats microplastics, it can then make its way up through the food chain and atmospherically deposited by rain, wind, or snow. And in terms of microplastic transportation, there is not a wide understanding of, and not a lot of research being done on this. So that is why we wanted to start this plastic um, snow project. Um, and a couple of our research questions. First, we wanna know how much microplastic is being deposited by snow throughout different parts of the United States, not just the Northeast. This project is throughout the entire nation. Um, we also want to know what types of microplastics are being transported, um, whether it be fibers or beads or fragments or so on. What we think is going to come out of this study is that our hypothesis is that urban areas would have more snow deposited microplastics, and we believe that microfragments will be the primary uh, microplastic found in snow. Um, again, this project is going to be uh, starting next year, so this is to 
let you guys know about our project and to hopefully gauge some interest from you and your students. The ultimate goals is, um, are to collect a deeper understanding of microplastics disseminated by snow, teach the public about the dangers of microplastics, and of course engage students and our communities to participate in this new science. So, although this project is starting a year from now, we did get some snow samples from some of our partners in Aspen. Um, this is snow collected from last season. So they put it in uh, glass jars, they sent it over to us at Lamont. We processed these snow samples and in just 10 milliliters of snow melt sample, we found hundreds of microplastic pieces of all different types. So on the top left there, you'll see all those orange, perfect, thank you, all these orange fluorescing pieces mm -hmm. are fragments. So this process um, was, first we digested all the organics, so we don't have any false fluorescing organic pieces. Um, then we stain it, and so all of these stained fluorescing pieces are microplastics here. Over here, this little green dot, that is a microbead. It's fluorescent green because it's made of a different plastic polymer than the orange fluorescing pieces. This is a microfiber, so that would be from synthetic clothing. And this is a piece of a microfilm. So you can see that just in a small sample of snow melt, we are already finding um, pretty significant results. So we're excited to continue this into the new, the next year. So again, this project is gonna start uh, next year, this project is geared a little bit more toward middle school and high school students. However, if you do have um, K through five students that would be interested in helping collect samples, we'd be happy to take them and we can kind of cater this citizen science project to fit with younger students as well. But basically what our snow stewards would be doing is collecting snow samples in their local area with uh, snow collectors that we'll be able to uh, provide to you and your students. They're then going to filter the snow melt through glass fiber filters to make sure that we're catching all these little micro plastic pieces from the water. Uh, they're going to be able to analyze the microplastics uh, in their classroom. We want them, or your students, to observe, quantify, and photograph all of their samples, and then they can send those filters back to us at Lamont and we can do some further analysis in our labs. So you will be a part of the collection and analysis process. Um, perfect. In the meantime, it is a year away, but we want you and your students to start making personal pledges to reduce your use of single-use plastics. So we have some ideas down here. Um, one, making a conscious effort to bring your own reusable bag to the grocery store and making sure that when you're out at a restaurant, you're refusing these plastic um, forks, knives, spoons, straws, cups. Uh, you could even bring your own, and, and that is a conversation starter uh, among a lot of people as well, which will help. Uh, there are also plastic pieces in a lot of detergent to help um, the abrasive washing to get your clothes cleaner. So just to make a conscious effort to look at the ingredients on your detergents and make sure you're buying things without plastic polymers in it. Um, hang drying your clothes instead of using the dryer where it pulls those uh, microfibers out of your clothes and then puts it into the air. And um, if you can, moving toward bar shampoo, conditioner, and soaps is better than using plastic bottles. These are just a couple of ideas. There are millions of others. And if you have other ideas, you and your students can come up with ideas and share them with us. And we'd love to showcase those on our website. So that leads us to... Um, if you need to contact us about any further questions, um, we have both emails down for both the X No Citizen Science Project and the Plastic Snow Citizen Science Project. We also have um, two websites that you can um, look at for further information, and we have an Instagram account for the X Snow Project. So feel free to check these out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Patrick, for these um, opportunities to become scientists and, and work with Lamont. Um, and, and contributing to data um, and to, to actually raise more awareness also about um, sort of the, the ubiquity of, of plastics and, mm -hmm. and of, of the effects of climate change. Um, we, we have about 15 minutes for questions. I see we have one question here from Shakira. How can young students also participate? Um, I'm assuming you're referencing the Plastics No Project. Um, so 
they would be able to, we have a couple different methods to look at microplastics. Um, at the lab, we have the ability to uh, process the samples a little bit more thoroughly and do some staining, which requires some use of chemicals. With students that are young, there is another method of fluorescing plastics with um, a special light and using a, a filter, like it is a royal blue filter is what they call them. Um, this would be able to be done with the supervision of a teacher at a young age. And so we would be able to um, provide you with this equipment. You could use it in your classroom. Um, ideally, we want to run this project with partners throughout the country so they would be able to hold on to our equipment throughout the year and then um, you would be able to communicate with your local partner to pick up this equipment for your students. So there are a couple different methods. Uh, we would like to standardize all of the samples by having one pristine snow melt sample that you've collected at the same time that you're analyzing the samples and send that to us and we can then look at it in the lab. Um, but having the students see the microplastics for themselves I think is really impactful. So we wanna make sure that they have that ability. And so this non-chemical light fluorescing method is, uh, seems to be the best answer, but we're going to test that out this winter before we launch it next winter. Laurel, are you talking about um, having different partners to um, throughout the school year? How, what is your capacity? How many schools or how many classrooms can you can you work with? Is, is that will it depend on the funding? It does. Yeah. Um, so some of this equipment can be uh, pretty pricey. So it does depend on the funding that we receive. And so we're still in that process of fundraising. Uh, what the ideal situation would be is since this equipment is expensive, we would have a partner or a community center, library, um, anyone who can serve as a basically a hub for local schools to then kind of check out equipment and they could bring it into their classroom, return it, so then the next class can use it. Um, that would be the ideal format, um, but it will be kind of a to be determined situation. <laughs> And then I had another question about the, the, the previous project, the um, X Snow. Um, you talked about the different equipment, about the clip on, the clip on camera and yeah. and the card. Um, so, how, what kind of equipment would you need to do this type of project with a classroom? And and how much would it would it cost a classroom? Is there any funding that you have that you could help um, schools with? Yeah, right now we're. Uh... We're still trying to raise funds, yeah. uh, uh, but some of the, I mean, the snow depth, all you need is a ruler. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that should be pretty inexpensive. If um, they did want to move. Right, the, with the cards, um, these are about $20, yeah. uh, but you can, print you can also print it out yeah. and laminate it. Um, and then the clip-on lens is probably the most expensive thing, uh, which is about $20, uh, but uh, that could be something that people could work in groups, maybe. And, right. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? <laughs> Do you have any questions um, or if you want to ask her feedback or um, from the audience? I'm curious if anyone is currently uh, doing citizen science projects in their classroom and what what those projects are. Oh, okay. Thank you, Shakira. Shakira says, thank you for answering. Before you find hubs, would you be open to coming and demonstrating how to look for the microplastics? Yes, absolutely. So um, that is a part of the the program would be um, hosting training sessions for teachers um, and any citizen scientists that would be interested. And so we would be hosting those um, as a start. Then hopefully our hubs or our nodes, our partners would then be trained and would be able to then further train other people in their area. So um, this is definitely a, a long term project, but I think when we first start, we'll be hosting some trainings at Lamont and showing you our process. Thank you. Thanks, Shakira. Shakira was at one of our panels. Oh, um, thank you. Yes. <laughs> so any 
Donate? Where can you donate? Great question. <laughs> um, both of our websites, Xnow and theplasticsnow.com, have areas to donate. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can also email us at uh, these emails that you see, and all of this will be shared as a resource with you on on your website. Great, thank you. Yes, for those those of you listening, um, this webinar, as all the others we have done, is recorded and is posted um, on our website. Um, let me see here, questions. You can contact us as well. Um, but so we have a website, uh, www.tccolumbia.edu slash sustainability, where you can find all the webinars. We also post um, PDFs of the PowerPoint presentations. Um, so you can um, look for uh, resources and look for inspirations on, on how to bring all these um, topics into the classroom um, and, and bring awareness, but also, um, you know, um, turn this into citizen science projects um, that, that maybe go beyond and change public policy um, in the end. Um, so I think, I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you to everyone you. for attending and thank you to our panelists for joining me here. Uh, upon leaving the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please fill it out and let us know how we can improve um, webinars um, next year. Um, and um, we hope to see you, um, we hope to see you in 2020 and please be safe today in the snow. <laughs> um, and um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you.